The Office of Bilingual Education and World Languages of the New York State Education Department presents this last workshop in its 2022 professional learning series, Lesson Planning Part 2, Lesson Planning Options for Thematic Units. This webinar is offered free of charge for world language educators and administrators working and studying in New York State educational institutions. The workshop's description is as follows. What can effective and engaging lessons look like in the context of a thematic unit? Lesson design and strategy selection can depend on the lesson focus, whether that be a single mode of communication, integrated modes of communication, a targeted language function, or a particular cultural context. In this session, participants will explore strategies that lend themselves well to different lesson designs to maximize student engagement and promote proficiency development. Our workshop presenters today are Dr. Joanne O'Toole, Bill Heller, and Dr. Lori Langer de Ramirez. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to invite Joanne, Bill, and Lori to begin this workshop. Thank you, Candy, and welcome back, everyone. So good that you're here. Um, we will tell you that even though we're concluding the 2022 series, we are already planning ahead for 2023. You will see on the screen that we have planned for seven sessions to date. There will be more than what you see up there with a wide range of topics to support your implementation of the revised New York State Learning Standards for World Languages and a wide range of voices. You won't just be listening to Bill, Lori, and myself. So it's very exciting. These are in addition to the 22 that will include today's that Candy mentioned have been recorded and are on the professional learning um, webpage of the NYSED OBE WL website. So please be sure that you utilize, take advantage of all of the professional professional learning opportunities available to you. So again, our session is entitled Lesson Planning Part 2, Lesson Planning Options for Thematic Units. And we have our webinar symbols here. Again, we ask that you keep your microphones muted. Instead of the thought bubble that we typically have, we're using our little guy with the magnifying glass to just ask you to notice things today. So there's quite a few slides that are going to ask you to take notice. And writing in the chat box, please reserve that for the very end of the webinar. When we put that icon up, we ask you not to engage in um, communication throughout this session so that no one is distracted. And then we do have content in a Google folder and we'll indicate which content that is on the slides with the Google folder icon. So let's get going. We have two goals today. And our first goal is I can identify sequences and scaffolds to, to intentionally apply in designing proficiency-oriented thematic lesson plans. And our second goal, I can identify how particular models, IPA, PACE, image, of lesson planning embed sequences that promote standards-based learning. So I want you to look at the title on this slide from thinking in sequences to intentional selection of sequences. Those of you who participated in lesson planning part one last month may remember that that session focused on how to think in sequences. And so this session builds on what we talked about then to now that we're thinking in sequences, how do we intentionally select the sequences that we want to use and for what purposes in our lesson planning? So that word intentionality, that's going to be key here. And we'll define intentionality as being deliberate or purposeful. And as teachers, we want to be very intentional deliberate, purposeful in making selections in regard to the various ways in which we sequence the tasks in our lesson plans, the content in our lesson plans 
to most efficiently promote student learning. We don't want that wiggly line from A to B, although sometimes we want to go a little off the beaten track, but not by a whole lot in order to move our, our students, excuse me, progressing towards the learning goal. And so why intentional sequencing? To move us towards what is the most important learning goal of our field, and that is proficiency development. And so just a reminder that there is a recorded webinar on proficiency and performance that if you miss that or need a refresher, it's recorded and available to you on that professional learning web page. But it is the purpose for which we teach world language. It is so that our students can communicate in that target language for real world purposes in spontaneous ways. And proficiency development, as we well know, is both a, is complex and it is a process. So what makes it complex? What makes it complex is having many parts. So let's look at what those parts are. They're the function or the purpose for communication. And just a reminder that when we have students carry out the language functions, think about words like express feelings, exchange information, describe, narrate, we also need to focus on the language structures or grammar that allow our students to carry out the language function. Also, the A that stands for accuracy. We want our students to over time as they develop proficiency, become more and more comprehensible and have increasing control of the target language. The C in proficiency is referring to the context about which our students can communicate, both in terms of making meaning from input and expressing meaning in output. And the contexts are supported by the vocabulary. The more vocabulary our students have, the more context within which they can communicate. And then the T, which is that text type, and text type being the length of text that they can produce um, or that they can interpret. And of course, we see our um, acronym FACT. So there's the complexity. And you'll notice we have our little sapling, like our novice learners, just those baby trees. And the process is the gradual growth and development of each of those elements of proficiency over time and with repeated performances. So we have provided you over time, and it's on our state ed web page at the standards and guidelines um, web page, lesson plan templates. And there's one for category one, two languages, one for category three, four languages, and one for classical languages. But what each of these templates have in common is at the very bottom is a place to design your instructional sequence. You'll see has to the left, what are those teacher actions? What are you doing as a teacher? And over to the right, the student actions. What is it that you are anticipating that your students are doing? And then it's divided into three parts, a beginning, a middle, and an end. And beginning, middle, and an end is the most basic of all sequences. And of course, we want to be intentional as we do that, as we design that sequence to plan for that efficient learning of the lesson learning target. And there we have that reminder to be efficient. So what are some of those sequences? that we want to have in mind as we are doing our intentional planning, our intentional sequencing that promote proficiency development. And again, some of these are ones that we discussed 
in the last webinar, Lesson Planning Part 1. So probably the heart and soul of all of this is moving our students from input-based learning tasks to output-based learning tasks. I can't produce language if I don't have any language to produce. So input must precede output. From meaning to form, brain research tells us that the brain seeks meaning. And so we have to focus our students on the meaning first. And then let's look at that form, the vocabulary, the grammar that underlies it. Over time, as you've engaged with the different webinars, you've learned about language functions that move from less complex to more complex. So our very first webinar back in 2021 on interpretive communication discussed the fact that the three language functions embedded in standard one, understand, interpret, and analyze are actually sequenced, that you have to understand on a literal level before you can interpret. And you have to be able to interpret before you can analyze, each one of those being progressively more sophisticated thought processes and language processes. When we did our workshop on the culture standards back in May of 2021, we again talked about the sequencing of our language functions in standard four and five, moving our students from identify, again, at that very literal level, to describe, to explain. And so it's important to think about using these sequences as we're intentional in planning the tasks for our lesson plans. Oh, and I think there's one more on this page I forgot about, which is from one topic to a related topic. So again, in our webinar on themes and topics, we talked about the fact that designing a thematic unit plan isn't about having a one topic of focus, like, oh, it's the food unit, but rather we're integrating multiple topics. And so a natural place to do that integration is right in the lesson plans, where we can sequence our students from one topic to the next. We also want to select certain sequences to purposefully scaffold our students' proficiency development. And so some examples of that include moving our students from their prior knowledge, whether that be in a previous year, a previous unit, um, a previous lesson to the new knowledge. Because again, brain research tells us we need to build schema by making those connections. Moving our students from comfort to stretch. Again, a key idea in our webinar on proficiency and performance, where we're moving our students from what they can produce comfortably at their particular level of proficiency to that next level of proficiency with scaffolding. And from that modeled to guided to independent performance, otherwise known as the gradual release of responsibility. An important model for building students' capacity and confidence to carry out the target language independently. So throughout the remainder of this webinar, we are going to illustrate what these sequences look like, both in individual lessons that have particular focuses, as well as in certain models of lesson planning that have already predetermined what the sequences are that you can simply adopt and follow. And so I'm going to turn this over to Bill Heller, who will demonstrate the idea of um, embedding a set of sequences into a lesson plan that has an emphasis on a language function. Thank you, Joanne. 
So this lesson that I'm going to um, demonstrate is for checkpoint C. It's part of a unit with an anchor topic in the arts for which the inquiry question is, how is an art a form of communication? As I show you the steps of this lesson, I'd invite you to notice how the sequences that Joanne just described are evidence in this lesson plan. The particular sequences you'll see evidenced are the sequence from prior knowledge to new knowledge, from input-based to output-based learning tasks, <clears throat> from the se uh, sequence from comfort to stretch, and then modeled to guided to independent performance. Prior to this particular output-focused lesson, in the unit, the students would have some input focused interpretive lessons to build background knowledge and generate topical vocabulary. My authentic resources are prints of 11 works of art from artists across the Spanish speaking world, representing different eras and styles of paintings. In these prior lessons, students would process input through interpretation of seven paintings to hypothesize why these works of art were created, what was the motive of the artist, and what was the purpose of the work? Was it for um, religious reasons? Was it to make money? Was it a ceremonial um, object? Why was it created? What was the artist's purpose? And then the second uh, interpretive lesson, an interpretation of an article about how to look at a painting the focus on the technique of looking at a work of art. And that article is linked in the resources for this um, uh, presentation at the very end. So the can-do statement for this particular lesson focuses on interpersonal communication standard two, and it's an output um, focus lesson. I can express opinions about the work, works of art by having a conversation with a classmate about various styles of art viewed in a gallery walk. So we see this is um, based, this lesson is based around the language function of expressing opinions. The lesson begins with a quick game of Pictionary, Pair Pictionary. This game serves to activate prior knowledge. And in this case, for prior vocabulary knowledge that the learners will be using in the gallery walk and in the conversation tasks in this lesson. And it also helps focus the learner on using the target language. I end this sequence by giving the learners the shortened student friendly version of today's can do statement. I can express opinions about works of art. The body of this lesson consists mainly in two parts. The first task in this instructional sequence consists of a gallery walk in which learners interpret authentic images from a variety of artists of the Spanish speaking world. In the gallery walk in groups of three, the learners move around the room to examine each of 11 art prints and record some basic information from gallery cards accompanying each image and their own observations of what they see on a graphic organizer. This additional interpretive task will give learners additional input to support them in the main interpersonal focus task in the lesson. During this task, the teacher walks around with a clipboard using Shrum and Glisten's talk rubric with a focus on the T for target language use. Now, even at checkpoint C, I'm cognizant of providing some instructional supports for my students to help them move from input to output. After the gallery walk, the teacher would engage several students in conversations, helping them express their opinions about art. This would provide a modeled performance for students to express their opinions, react to the opinions of their partner, and to ask someone else's opinion. In addition, they'll have access to a conversation map on talking about art, which would be, of course, in the target language, that students will already be familiar with, along with the graphic organizer they compile during the gallery walk. The supports provide the comfort. Keep the, keeping the conversation going 
reacting appropriately to what their partner says and giving reasons will provide the stretch. Next, the students will be grouped in pairs and given a set of question cards in which they talk about their opinions of the paintings. During this part of the lesson, I'll project the slide of the conversation map to keep the conversations going. The learners will take turns over each um, answering each question card. The interpersonal task with all of its scaffolds and supports would be considered a guided performance that aligns with the unit and lesson can do statements, I can express opinions on works of art. The questions they might consider would be, what is your, was your favorite painting of the 11 you examined, why? What was the least favorite painting, why? And the, again, these um, at Checkpoint C, these questions would be certainly presented in the target language. Do you prefer more realistic art or more abstract art, why? Do you have a favorite artist, why or why not? What painting did you find most interesting? Why? And what painting did you want to know more about? Again, the students can use their resources in order to answer the questions and um, the follow-up why and why not giving reasons provides the uh, stretch that um, can push the students to uh, produce um, additional language. Finally, to close the lesson, uh, it will conclude with students returning to their seats, opening their laptops, and opening a Padlet page to share with their classmates their answer to the question, what did you learn about your tastes in painting? A sample answer from the teacher will already be included on the Padlet to create a model for the learners. The task provides a formative assessment, promotes student accountability, and then challenges the students to progress from a guided performance to a more independent performance. Now Lori will share with us a lesson that emphasizes vocabulary development. Thank you, Bill. So we're gonna talk about a uh, thematic unit that we've talked about before. Uh, and we're gonna focus in on vocabulary and really building on students' prior knowledge. Some sequences to notice in this example lesson are prior knowledge, from prior knowledge to new knowledge, moving from input-based to output-based learning tasks, modeled to guided to independent performance, and one topic to a related topic. This lesson is a checkpoint A lesson. So we start with a context. Our context is a fantasy trip to Peru for our students. And they're going to be visiting a specific event in Peru, the Guinea Pig Festival. And for the Guinea Pig Festival, um, folks dress up their guinea pigs in lots and lots of different clothing. It is a cultural event. And so students are going to be taking this fantasy trip and really building on prior knowledge. So students already know some vocabulary around clothing. In this unit, they're going to be building on that prior knowledge and adding some new knowledge, adding new items of vocabulary uh, around the clothing, and also really practicing it in a different context, something that they hadn't seen before. Something to, learn, to look at in this part is the sequencing of the modes. And here we're going to be looking at moving from input to output. So to start with input, of course, we start with a really good authentic resource. And this is a great resource that goes through all the different types of clothing that one might wear depending on the weather. And it's also tied to some geography. So students will interact with this particular text they're going to identify clothing appropriate for the trip according to the weather. So we need to know what the weather is like in this part of Peru at the time of year when we will be traveling. And this authentic resource will help them do that. So they start with the interpretive and the sequence then goes to an interpersonal task. It starts with students packing their suitcase at home. 
The suitcase is actually a file folder that they are asked to fill with the clothing that they believe they would need on this trip. They can use clip art, they can draw, they can use cutout images from magazines, whatever they like. When they come in the next day, they're going to sit opposite each other in pairs. And in this scaffolded AB pair activity, students are going to exchange information back and forth about what they packed for this particular trip based on their particular suitcases. And then we finish with a presentational task where students will describe the clothing that they have in common in their suitcases or things that are different, things that they learn from their interpersonal conversation that might be a little bit different that they pack in these suitcases for our fantasy trip. Another example of sequencing the modes from input to output starts once again, you guessed it, with a wonderful authentic resource. This is a flyer wow. announcing the guinea pig festival. Students are going to be able to see the different type of activities that go on in this festival. So they will identify some of the events that happen based on this flyer. Moving from that, they're going to get together in pairs and think about how they might dress their own guinea pig if they were to put a guinea pig into the competition. So that's an interpersonal speaking task. And moving to the output, a presentational task where they go ahead and dress their guinea pig and then they describe to the class what their guinea pig is wearing, why you chose that particular clothing. And then of course, at the end, we have to award a winner. And I think this guinea pig is the winner. So that's some sequencing of the modes with these three tasks. And then as Joanne was referencing, we're always looking to segue to a related topic so that there's some connection from this topic to the next. And one that felt really um, timely and interesting to students was a question about dressing animals. So we'll go ahead and see that next interpersonal task where students are going to exchange opinions about whether it's appropriate to dress up animals. Then we'll move to a presentational task where students describe times when maybe we dress up our pets and compare to the guinea pig festival and dressing up those animals. And so that's a presentational task where they're looking at what they might have connections to in their own lives. Maybe they dress up their pets, comparing it to dressing up animals in this festival and kind of looking at what some of the similarities and differences are in these activities. And then finally, they're going to give reasons why we should or shouldn't put clothing on animals. And you can imagine middle school students have very interesting opinions about this topic. We're going to look at a different lesson model now with an emphasis on integrated communication. The sequence to notice here is moving from input-based to output-based learning tasks. Here we're going to focus on the IPA model, the Integrated Performance Assessment Model. It's an instructional sequence within a lesson plan. And so as Joanne referenced, we have, of course, the beginning, the middle, and the end of a lesson in an instructional sequence. And we can bring in different modes and, and really integrate them into the beginning, middle, and end, starting with input, as we said, so an interpretive communication task, moving to something that is involving output. So interpersonal communication in this case. And the end of the lesson might be another output task, in this case, presentational communication. But doesn't have to go exactly in this order. There is some movement. You can move around. I've sometimes done presentational, a presentational task in the middle, and an interpersonal task in the end. And that's totally fine as well. But moving from input to output. 
the IPA model can also move across lesson plans. So it doesn't have to all come into one lesson beginning, middle and end, but rather from day to day. So for example, on day one, we might have some input where students are reading something, listening to something. So there's some interpretive task that they're involved in. On the second day, we might move to output and have them involved in interpersonal communication. So a conversation about what they just read. And perhaps on the third day, move to output. Maybe they will present something about what they just read, building on the conversation and then present. But again, doesn't have to be interpersonal presentational. It could also be presentational and then interpersonal. Always moving from input to output. And now I will turn it over to Joanne for a lesson model with an emphasis on grammar learning. And before I do that, I just want to comment on the IPA. Why didn't we give you an example lesson? Well, because in effect, you saw in both Bill and Lori's lessons that they were following that model of output to input. And so just keeping that in mind, that sequence, that frame to inform your lesson planning can really follow one of the core principles of proficiency development. And the notion of models is the idea that the sequences have already been predetermined for you and you can follow the sequence as you design your own lesson plans. A quick reminder, a number of people have been throwing questions in the chat. We will take your questions at the end of this session. So hold on to those for a little bit longer. Thank you. So for those of you who attended our grammar um, workshops back in early 2022, you had the opportunity to see the model that I'm going to be showing you. It's called the PACE model. And you'll notice the little um, folder icon up in the corner. One of the things I want to point out is in our folder where we've put various documents, one of the documents has um, information about all of these different sequences of lesson planning and more. And so you will have the opportunity to um, take a look at those after the session. Again, we're going to ask you not to continue to put things in the chat until the end of our session. Thank you. So the PACE model, rather than having beginning, middle, and end, you will see it has what's called the presentation phase, attention phase, co-construction phase, and extension. And so we have four phases rather than three. But again, another sequence. And so as I demonstrate this to you, I'd like you to take notice of how the PACE model moves our learners from meaning to form. And in this case, form refers to grammar. From input-based to output-based learning tasks, and from model to guided to independent performance. So the name PACE, each one of those letters refers to one of the steps in the sequence. So that presentation phase is first, that's our P, and this is there's a focus solely on meaning, where there's lots of input and modeled use of the form and context. So in this phase, this is where you as a teacher are preparing learners to engage with a story or text that may be authentic, and you're priming and building their background knowledge, and you're engaging them with that story or text multiple times, multiple ways, with a focus on their comprehension and the meaningfulness of the story or text that you're engaging your students with. The attention phase that follows is a focus on form. Again, here form is referring to grammar and it's another source of input. And it's a very short phase where you're really drawing learners attention to the targeted grammatical structure that was seeded throughout the text or story that you engage them with in the presentation phase. 
it's followed by a co-construction phase where the sole focus is on the form or on the grammatical structure. And you engage your learners in dialogue to have them notice and identify the patterns. Well, they've already noticed, but to have them identify the patterns and start co-constructing the rules related to the um, targeted grammatical structure. And finally, this is where you're moving students in the extension phase to back to the focus on meaning and form. And this is where they're, they're creating output and moving from guided to independent performance. So you're going to have learners carry out scaffolded activities in which they meaningfully apply the co-constructed rules. So I know that was a lot, but I'm going to illustrate that to you. And I'm just gonna say I'm a Spanish teacher and I'm going to give French my best effort. Um, so forgive me French teachers if the pronunciation's off by a little bit. Um, the context of this unit that this lesson would be embedded in is called creating connections in a diverse world. And this would be a checkpoint B unit. And a key language function of the unit would be explain. And the grammatical structure of our focus is a prepositional verb with that preposition being de, de, sorry, um, followed by the infinitive. And in particular, we're going to be using the expression permet de faire that shows up in Elise Gravel's beautiful cartoon called La Diversité me permet. Um, and Bill, if you click it one more time, people will have an opportunity to see the pattern that follows in each one of those little cartoon sequences. So let's take a look at what the presentation phase would look like. So first, to prepare my learners to engage with it, I might have them consider the word diversity and create a list of words and phrases that they associate with diversity. Then have them share those with a partner and then with a class, a little cooperative learning think pair share. Moving them on to priming and building background knowledge before we actually read the text in full, have them read the title, Diversity Allows Me To and then identify the words and phrases on that list that they created that might meaningfully complete the title sentence. And then engaging them with that learners multiple ways, multiple times, not only for comprehension, but for meaningfulness. We'll read it one frame at a time, identifying what does the author suggest that diversity allows people to do. And then Learners can check that off on their list if it was something they had included and then add it to their list if it was something that maybe they hadn't included. And then maybe take the items that the author proposed and rank order them. Which one would be most important to which one may be least important if any of them, of course, are important. And then have a comparison of the rank ordered lists with a partner giving a reason why you ranked them the way that you did. So after we've engaged with all of that meaningfulness where we saw over and over and over again a particular grammatical structure, now as a teacher, I want to draw my students' attention to that structure. And so I might have them circle the preposition and the subsequent verb in each sentence. I might display the text with the preposition and subsequent verb bolded whether it's highlighted, underlined, or color-coded, or I might ask students just to look closely at the prepositions and subsequent verbs for patterns they might notice. Attention phase is all about noticing. And now that we've noticed, we want to start co-constructing. And so in this phase, 
I'm going to have a dialogue with my learners. And I would do this in English at checkpoint B. What are the patterns and what are the rules? And so here are some questions. What did you notice? What are the patterns that you saw? Were there any differences? If so, what were they? How do you think it's formed? Let's try it out and we might try out a few. Let's look at the infographic again. Do our rules for forming the structure work? And once we're satisfied that the rules we've come up with work, then we're going to move on to the extension phase where we bring back meaning, but we're pairing meaning and form. And so this is where I'm going to have my learners carry out scaffolded activities from guided to independent practice with those co-constructed rules. And so keeping in mind our um, gradual release of responsibility model, we do. So let's together create an additional frame for the cartoon. Ma parme with the preposition de and its contracted form de with an infinitive. And then you'll do it with support. So we're using that think pair share strategy again to create, rehearse, share out an additional example that applies the rules. And then with further support of a small group, maybe a five day awareness camp campaign about what diversity permits one to do. And students in their small groups will create illustrated and reproducible posters for each day beginning with the phrase that began the original authentic text. So that was a model, the PACE model, that really allowed us to focus on helping our students learn grammar, but using intentional sequencing to get them there, meaning and form. Here's another model, which is specifically emphasizing cultural inquiry. You will notice, again, we have four sections in our sequence in what is called the image model. The image model specifically works with cultural images. And it has these four sections, images and making observations, then moving to analyzing additional information about the product and or practice, generating hypotheses about cultural perspectives and exploring perspectives and further reflection. So let's take a closer look. What I'd like you to notice in terms of the intentional sequencing in the image model is that it moves from input-based to output-based learning tasks and from less complex language functions to more complex language functions. So let's take a look. The first section, images and making observations, we're going from input to output. And our focus here is on the less complex language function. So in this phase, the teacher is presenting one or two images that show a single cultural product or practice. Having the students identify what the image is or images are, and then just asking them some basic fact questions. It moves to analyzing additional information about the product and or practice, more input, but still the focus on that less complex language function. And don't forget, the less complex language function for interpretive communication is understand. And the less complex language function for the culture standards is identify. And that's what our emphasis is here. And this is where we're providing students a short text of some sort, or maybe even some data that give them some additional information about the cultural product or practice that goes along with the images that they viewed. 
And then we're going to give them a basic interpretive task, maybe answering some questions or filling out a graphic organizer, but again, at that fact-based level. From here, we have students generating hypotheses. And just by the name of it, we know that we're moving to a more complex language function. And we're moving again from input to output because we're presenting students with a second set of images, ones that add depth to what they can understand about the cultural product or practice that was seen in the first set of images. And we're going to start with some brief fact based questions, but then we're going to move to what are referred to as thought questions, ones that have students hypothesize potential meanings, which of course are the cultural perspectives behind the product or practice. And then we conclude the image model by having students explore perspectives and reflect further. We ask them, to, uh, and, and here again, we're going from um, output to input to output and from less to more complex language functions. And so we're asking students what questions they have and what they wonder. And then either having them do out of class research or in class research to answer their questions and then have them subsequently share what they have found. Again, with a focus on cultural perspectives. So let's see an example. The context for this lesson is the unit protecting our world, which could be a checkpoint B or checkpoint C. And a key language function would be describe. And the cultural pr product are the colones. And the colones are the um, currency, the, the paper currency from Costa Rica. And so you see an example of one colon right up here, the Cinco Mil 5000 Colón. So here's our images and making observations. So I'm going to show my students two colones. Have my students identify what are these images? And they should be able to figure out they're looking at currency. And then some fact questions, what do you see? And clearly they're gonna start seeing some animals where is this? And they'll notice the background images, what's happening. Um, that's maybe less visible in these pictures, but they should be able to come up with some facts about what do they see. And then we move on where I'm providing them some fact-based information. So here's a, a YouTube video, Biodiversidad biodiversity. And so I'm going to have them view this video clip about biodiversity, and I'm going to pause it so that they can complete some fact-based information, a graphic organizer. So they'll start noticing some of the animals that are part of the biodiversity of Costa Rica and some of the geography that is part of the biodiversity of Costa Rica. And then they can jot down some observations or conclusions. Again, depending on the proficiency level I do this at, they may do it in English, they may be doing it in the target language. I move them on after we've got all of this factual information to generating hypotheses about the cultural perspectives. And so I'm going to show them additional colones, where as you can notice, they're going to see different biomes and they're going to see different animals. And we'll repeat the same fact-based questions, but then move them to thought questions. What do you see that's similar or different from the previous colonists you viewed? And for what purposes do you think Costa Rica, that should be a has, my apologies, has these varied designs on their currency? What do you wonder? And start getting them thinking about the meaning behind the cultural practice of putting these images on the currency and the cultural product of the currency. And from here, again, they might independently do this work, or I might just provide it to them in class, 
keeping in mind what they wonder, I'm going to have them read this authentic resource. It's a, a website, Flora y Fauna de Costa Rica, asking them both fact and thought based questions. Which of your questions are answered? What else did you learn? What is the importance or the cultural perspectives of the images on the colones and for whom? And what else do you want to know? So notice how this is very inquiry based, also sparking students' curiosity. So I do want to point out in the document that we provided you that has these sequences, there's an additional um, lesson planning model called the interactive model. It's similar to the IPA in terms of sequencing the modes of communication, but it really, really digs deeply into the interpretive mode such that it's a wonderful model for literacy development. We didn't have time to bring it to you today, but it's available to you in that document. And all of these models are discussed in the High Leverage Teaching Practices book, enacting the work of language instruction that is referenced in the reference slide of this presentation. So revisiting today's goals, I can identify sequences and scaffolds to intentionally apply in designing proficiency-oriented thematic lesson plans. And I can identify how particular models, the IPA, the PACE, the image models of lesson planning embed sequences that promote standards-based learning. So at this point, we want to thank you for your incredible attention, and we invite you to put your questions in the chat. And we see that there's already a couple questions there. We'll give you a moment to put other questions in the chat for us. And Lori will deliver the questions to me and perhaps to Bill, because I think one of the questions is very particularly for Bill. While we're waiting for some questions to be answered, I want to thank Joanne, Bill, and Lori for another enlightening workshop. Remember that we will have a recording uploaded to the website and pre-registered attendees will get a certificate of attendance.